it's like we expect it's so simple because we're like yeah you should it should just work but like yeah. when you get under the hood it's like wait this is a big fucking pain in my ass <laughs> Welcome to the Thriving Musician Podcast, where you go behind the scenes with musician, speaker, and consultant Spencer List to hear stories of how professional musicians navigated the inevitable financial challenges that arise on the path to creative freedom and get insight from industry professionals on how to break through to the next level of your finances, career, and art. Now, here's your host, Spencer List. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Thriving Musician Podcast. Today I'm very excited to talk with my very close friend and colleague Jason St. George and I'm really excited to talk about his story. It's really magnificent. Jason is a musician, educator, computer scientist, and machine learning engineer currently completing his master's degree at Rochester Institute of Technology where he will be moving to Boston soon in June 2019 to begin working as a data scientist for a large cloud-based predictive analytics firm. After a rural, quintessentially American upbringing in upstate New York, Jason completed his Bachelor of Music Performance and Music Theory from University of North Texas in 2013, which is where we went to school together, going on to a career as a musician and educator in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, where he worked and taught as a freelance professional for over five years, making a maximum of 21000 per year. So in about 2015, him and I just started really getting real and um, changing our mindsets, and soon after, he would then decide to leave the music business in 2017, while still maintaining an intimate relationship with music, to learn the skills to become a computer scientist and acquire capital via a high-income W-2 position to use for investment purposes. He is currently published in Springer and presented his research on sonification of black hole mergers at the Modeling, Simulation, and Visualization Conference at the Computer Science and Engineering World Conference, in July of 2018, where he was a committee chair member. Currently, his attention is focused on machine learning and artificial intelligence research in the domain of music information retrieval, which companies like Spotify use to generate recommended artist playlists. So there's so much more I could intro him with, but let's just get right to it. Thank you so much for joining me, Jason. Yeah, thanks, Spencer. Glad to be on. So we could talk for hours and maybe we'll do that now, but um, let's start just from the beginning. So for those who don't know you, can you just give us a little bit more background, maybe of your upbringing musically, what led you to music kind of, and then take us through to this transition that you're still currently going through. Sure. Um, You know, they have the kind of old wise tale about playing Mozart in the womb when the child's still, you know, a fetus. And mm-hmm. uh, I remember my mom telling me about doing shit like that when I was growing up and uh, she would play Mozart and Benny Goodman and stuff like that. And Like the two most favorite music genres that I kind of gravitate towards were the things that I think I was surrounded with in childhood, you mm-hmm. know, really early childhood. And so uh, I kind of grew up thinking I was going to be a neuroscientist of some kind or involved in physics or I was really into the sciences growing mm-hmm. up. And then when I got to high school, I started playing saxophone uh, and a whole new world kind of opened up and I got super into jazz and I said, all right, this is super cool. Um, I could have way more fun doing this. And I kind of made a snap decision. I was like, I'm gonna go to school for music. And mm. really with no um, forethought into like, what am I getting into? What's the debt structure gonna look like? What's the job <laughs> prospect market? Of like, course none not. of those things. <laughs> Yeah. So, and in a way, I think it was good. I'm glad I didn't because it was very formative for me to go through the experiences that I did at UNT and meet wonderful people like you and our Mm -hmm. friend group who we still are in touch with. Um, But I think, you know, kind of being naive uh, was uh, something that I I wish someone had talked to me about earlier and say, Hey, this is what, what it's going to look like. Here are going to be your options. And then if you're okay with that, let's move forward. But uh, then I, I went to UNT, we met, I got really, uh, uh, I would say, into the competitive market 
at UNT. It's a very competitive school. It's very, um, your, your status is constantly um, put against the relationship of everyone else in the hierarchy. Mm-hmm. So they have, uh, if anyone's not familiar, the lab band system at UNT is a series of nine uh, big bands that people compete to get the highest possible position. And the one o'clock is the uh, theoretically the best band that the school has and everyone's fighting to get into those top spots. Um, so I remember feeling a little traumatized by that and not really recognizing it until after school and being like, man, what? I've been like depressed for years and <laughs> I'm not really taking care of myself. And I'm like, have a really poor attitude about competition and jealousy. Yeah. Uh, and so I think after, after school, I was teaching and playing for a while and kind of felt like there was less and less, like I was getting diminishing returns yeah. out of what I was doing. I didn't really feel fulfilled even though, you know, I had a great schedule. I worked three or four days a week teaching and playing and I could make enough money to survive. Uh, but it kind of became really apparent after a couple of years that this is not sustainable. Mm-hmm. And that kind of started to gnaw at me. And then we started chatting more about finances and we really got into real estate for a while and figure, okay, what's, what are some investment vehicles that can get us into a place of financial independence and financial freedom? Yeah. Uh, and so I, I thought that, you know, where I kind of started was really uh, that shift was when we started hanging out a lot. I think that's like the germination of that kind of seed. Mm-hmm. And then from there it blossomed into a two or three year uh, infatuation with learning about finance and learning about uh, how to become uh, prepared for a future that you want to be in. And yeah. I think a lot of the problem that I was having was I was too short-sighted and I was really engaged in the, the mindset of being a starving artist and being mm-hmm. a musician. And I think I felt really uh, cheated that I was like sold these ideas that yeah. I think weren't really accurate or helpful in the long term. Uh, so in 2016, I believe, uh, I had a car accident, I had a concussion, and that kind of shook me up. It was actually really, I think, one of the pivotal moments where I kind of recognized that this is not going to work and I have to change something uh, because I didn't have health insurance. I didn't really uh, know where I was going to get money if I couldn't work for several weeks or a month at a right. time. Like, what am I going to do? Yeah. So that was good for me. And then I, I started thinking more about the future. And I realized that I don't need to be a musician to feel good about myself, like to feel like I need to be playing every night. And some mm-hmm. people have that. And that's okay. If they really feel that they need to be out there gigging every night, that's your passion. That's awesome. Go for mm-hmm. it. Yeah. But I recognize I didn't need that. Yeah. So I wanted to start looking other places and uh, made a spreadsheet of six or seven different possible career paths that I could pursue. And in this Excel sheet, I ranked them by uh, opportunity cost, actual cost, uh, what doors could it potentially open or close, um, how long to complete certifications or school or whatever resources Mm -hmm. you need, uh, and then would it be fun? You know, would I actually like it? Mm -hmm. And computer science just came out on top. All the categories seem to have the best return uh, and then I said, all right, we're going to start moving in this direction. And I made some calls. I talked to a professor who's been my advisor, is really wonderful, Hans-Peter Bischoff at Rochester Institute of Technology. He called me after I sent an email to the uh, advisor, Cindy Wolfer, wonderful person. Uh, and he, I sent them an email, explained my situation, saying I'm a musician. I'm thinking about going back to grad school. And I'm really you know, thinking about maybe next year. He calls me like two or three days later and it's like, yeah, uh, you know, just send me your application, email me when, you know, when you get it in, I'll look at it. And I was like, wait, 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 it's March. <laughs> <laughs> it's way past admission, anything. Yeah. <laughs> and he was very nice and very uh, compassionate and was like, yeah, I'll, I'll look at it. And I think he was interested that there's someone that has a different background that's interested in this stuff that is kind of different from the run of the mill person that he deals with yeah Um, so then that started the journey that i'm on right now and i feel like uh, our discussions about financial independence directly spawned my kind of idea of getting a high w-2 income to 
increase the amount of net worth that I have in the shortest period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not necessarily about, I want a good job that makes a lot of money. It's like our problem was we couldn't get loans yeah. for about two or three years ago because we didn't have any equity. We didn't have any net worth. Nothing. Um, right. <laughs> Banks are going to say, mm, no, no, sorry. Uh, so I feel like this will be a good strategy because if you can make, you know, say if you could save 50% of your income uh, and hypothetically, let's say you're making a hundred thousand dollars a year. If you could save $50,000 a year and live on the other 50,000, you can put that into a large variety of investment vehicles that'll get you between five and 15% return that start that process of snowballing mm -hmm. compounded interest over mm -hmm. a long period of time. And I figure I'm, I'm young enough. I'm almost 30 uh, where I have another good 25 or 30 working years before I really uh, would be concerned about mm -hmm. not being able to generate uh, uh, earned income. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. It's crazy. So, and I think about it all the time. Um, I used to joke with Jason about, you know, I'd say he was like a year through his master's program. I say, I would say, what were you doing a year ago? And like, <laughs> he'd say, I was just chilling in Denton, you know, like, and now he's just like about to be done with this master's program com is learning all these computer science languages. It's just insane. He's on the verge of, um, a six figure salary. And it's, it's crazy because I think a lot of people think that changes like these take a lot of time, right? Yes. And here we are. I mean, what you've been, it's been a year and a half that you've been in the program. That's about right. I, I'd say I really started in uh, August of 2017, but I would say that maybe March or April would be mm -hmm. the two-year mark coming up in 2019. Wow. Can you talk a little bit about when you had this, you know, you had your car accident, the concussion, and this kind of wake-up moment. Can you talk about, was it very difficult to make this decision or was it kind of obvious to you? Can you just talk a little bit more about that, that pivotal moment? Sure. Um, it was kind of surreal because I think I was really anxious about change and mm -hmm. thinking, am I really going to do this? And I think a lot of the fear was related to fear of failure. It's like, yeah. no, I'm, I'm not good enough for this. I'm not smart enough. Uh, it's too risky. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go get more debt. And uh, I think the, I had support from a lot of great friends, like talking to, to you, Spencer, and to my friend, Kyle, uh, mm -hmm. who's been really supportive. Um, I think it was imperative for them to say like, no, you, you, this is cool. You're going to yeah. be fine. And I think having that um, support was made it easier for me to make a decision. But it's paradoxical because that was happening on one level. I had, you know, this reticence on my own part by saying, oh, maybe this isn't going to work out. I had a friend supporting me and that was a dynamic. But there was another dynamic going on simultaneously that was seemingly paradoxical because we've talked about this too, about when you're doing the right things, the universe kind of opens for you mm -hmm. and people start coming into your life that are connections that you need to know for something to happen. Mm -hmm. And it seems really odd at first, like you're in some sort of fairy tale and there's like, this yeah. isn't real. <laughs> Maybe I'm dreaming, yeah. but <laughs> I kind of uh, started to feel that where doing the grind of being a freelance musician and teaching seemed to be this kind of constant uphill battle. And it felt like every day was like, Oh God, oh, not again. and you're just struggling through it. Mm -hmm. And I kind of realized that that was an indicator that like, oh, you're moving the wrong direction. Mm. You're, you're doing something wrong. If it's obviously, I don't think life should be easy, mm -hmm. but I also don't think that you should be like Atlas, you know, carrying the world every day. Like, I don't think it should feel like that. So, so I kind of recognized that while this was all happening, uh, like my anxiety and reticence about it, I was also really calm and collected at the same time where it was like, yeah, this is happening. I'm not actually feeling like I'm the one taking action. It's almost mm. like things are being done. Things are moving forward in a, in a progression and I'm watching it happen. Mm. And I think that's a really important 
perspective to be able to access because it's helped me be able to remove myself from the equation mm -hmm. and realize that I don't have as much control as I think I do, but that's okay. It's yeah. like you, you want to, I think about it like steering a, a big giant like oil tanker with a little wooden oar. It's like, <laughs> you've got some freedom, you've got some um, movement, but you're not going to 180 like immediately. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I think the secret for that is like oaring your, rowing yourself with the oar, lining up with something in the future that by the time you get there, it's going to move the ship close enough in that direction to take you downstream. Yeah. Uh, more than being like, I'm going to change myself overnight and everything is going to happen right now. Right. Um, so that moment, I think, had this weird paradoxical factor where I felt totally sh shitting my pants, terrified, but also calm and collected and saying, yeah, this is the right thing. I know this is going to be fine. Right. It felt right. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about your relationship with music now? Sure. Um, I'd say it's actually improved. Yeah. Um, counterintuitively i thought that i was losing something mm -hmm. that i was afraid of like oh, i'm selling out you know i'm being that person now <laughs> like it was too hard they didn't they couldn't cut it man yeah and so <laughs> i kind of uh at first i was a little bummed because like man i'm not really playing anymore i don't have as much time because i'm studying for grad school um but i think some of the trauma that i experienced at unt from being in a hyper competitive environment uh, it took some time to wear off yeah. because for a while, what would happen is I'd listen to jazz and I'd get upset about not feeling in, engaged in the community. It's like, Oh, I, I gave this up. I'm never going to be able to do that again. Mm. And I realized that was just a, I don't know what you would call it, like a rationalization that your brain wants to make to make you feel shitty <laughs> for lack of a better <laughs> word. I think, um, I needed time to get over myself and realize that it doesn't matter whether or not I'm the next Chris Potter or the next, you know, ex idol musician. Mm -hmm. um, but that I have a, an important emotional and personal relationship with music. So lately what I've been doing is listening to a lot more. Um, I've been expanding my genre, uh, my listening genre spectrum. So I've been, going much more into electronic music uh, that I really didn't have an interest in before. Mm -hmm. uh, and also hip hop, a lot of uh, you know, modern African-American music, I think is amazing. Uh, I've also been expanding inside the classical and jazz world. Um, been listening to uh, a lot of Bruckner and a lot of kind of late romantic composers and maybe early 20th century uh, composers, Stravinsky, Schoenberg, Webern, Berg, those guys. Um, and, and I feel like I can remove myself enough to where I don't feel uh, tied to the identity of being a musician anymore. And it's helped my, the, the quality of my listening sessions improve, which is ironic because I could hear better. So now I feel like I actually understand the music more hmm. than when I was practicing music regularly. Wow. That's amazing. I'm really happy to hear that your relationship is much healthier than it was before. Thanks. Me too. So enough about music. <laughs> sure. We could do a whole podcast so, just about tunes. So most of these interviews, we really don't talk about music, which is kind of the point. But um, so sure. uh, I'm going to ask you, a few questions. These are these are questions that I ask my clients on the first session, and they're really good self awareness questions. And so this will just give the listeners, you know, an idea of where you're coming from. And so, first question is, what is your relationship with the idea of money? And the examples are, you know, do you love it? Do you hate it? Does it stress you out? Does it keep you up at night? You know, your level of knowledge about it, and or maybe what is your relationship, but maybe what was it before and what is it now? Cause I'm sure it's yeah. changed a lot. It has, um, maybe a little bit of all of the above. <laughs> I feel like <laughs> there are times where it stresses me out and there yeah. are times where I feel great about it and I feel in control. Um, I'd say before I was predominantly terrified mm. and resentful about money. I think mm -hmm. I was bitter 
and kind of had this attitude that like all rich people are greedy, Mm -hmm. arrogant pricks and, you know, did something bad to get all that money. Like, Oh, they, they had to have done something. (laughs) Uh, what's the word? Like unethical Uh, or something. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and so I, I feel like before I was shooting myself in the foot because it's like, I didn't appreciate people who knew how to handle money. I would think that, it, it kind of gave this air of distaste about the whole financial sector. So mm-hmm. I said, Nope, not going to deal with that. Yeah. And as a consequence, when I was 26 as a musician, I had like less than $2,000 in savings. And I had, Oh, I'd say I was pretty much month to month as far as rent and mm-hmm. food is concerned. Uh, and I had a, you know, small studio apartment. It was like 500 square feet, you know, mm-hmm. And I'm not docking that if, if you know, that works for you, but like, <laughs> I need more space. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I think my relationship with money started with my parents, mm-hmm. where they are, uh, my mother is actually somewhat financially literate. She, she knows how to save. She knows how to pay bills on time. She's been very good about that my whole life. Uh, but the thing I've noticed is their attitude is very negative about mm. Sharing, sharing is the wrong word. Uh, discussing financial matters with anyone, and they seem very reticent to talk to anyone about finances because I think they're afraid of some sort of unethical behavior that people can take that takes advantage of them. Mm. So they think like, oh well, if I say too much, someone will overhear our conversation and they'll like lift my bank account and from it's like <laughs> paranoia you know, really, really paranoid. And it kind of made me have this subconscious attitude that like, Oh, we don't, we don't talk about that. We don't, no one talks about money. That's just a private thing. Mm -hmm. And that made me not ask questions. Made me not really. Cause when I got to college, it's like, well, I don't know what I'm doing. Basically, (laughs) I don't know how to balance a checkbook. I don't know how to like save. Um, but they had good intentions and I think they, they wanted to try to provide as much as they could for me as a child and mm-hmm. growing up. So I appreciated that, but they never disclosed any of the operating principles when I was growing up. Mm. Uh, so my relationship it started as this kind of, uh, Oh, that's a thing that only greedy people care about mm-hmm. yeah. money. Uh, and you know, us artistically free creative people, we don't, we're so, evolved beyond that we don't care about money it's like ah actually it's really important we should talk about it and i I think a change came for me around the time when we started talking about this was that uh, i kind of recognized that you have to reframe the equation and the one thing that we've talked about a lot is uh, the idea of trading time for money Mm -hmm. time for dollars and if you reframe the equation that way it's like what do people want they want freedom and they don't just want freedom to do anything they want. They want the time in which to pursue the activities that bring them happiness. Right. And that's more important to me than having the cash on hand Mm -hmm. because what you're doing is having this pool of cash and you say, okay, give this to the government and to vendors and to uh, supermarkets and you, they give you all the resources that you need so you can spend your time how you want. Mm, yeah. And then the equation becomes, or the question becomes, how can we achieve the most amount of time? Yeah. Maximize your, your time freedom. Mm-hmm. And I figured, well, okay, obviously more money would help with that, but I don't want to do it in a way where I'm slaving doing something I don't want forever yeah. and just using that uh, income, W-2 income, to continually increase your standard of living and then your debt equals your standard of living and then you don't have anything to actually uh, create passive investment vehicles for the future. Um, So putting it in those terms uh, made me realize that we're actually all going for the same goal. It's just how are we trying to get there? And that helped me really put a positive spin on it and say, okay, I, I care about money in a way that will allow me to do the things I want with my life with the people that I care about and I'm close to. And that changed the game for me. That made me kind of drop the, the attitude uh, about being like elitist about money and not mm-hmm. feeling like it was important in life to think about. Boom. Nailed it. <laughs> That's amazing. So you've really kind of detached and turned it on its head. And, you know, it's 
a very important tool. And I think the way you're thinking about it and the way we've been talking about it is, like you said, it's such a positive way. Like you almost can't go wrong. If you, if you turn yeah. anything into a positive thing, like I, when I talk about taxes, I try to flip it on its head and talk about it positively. Mm-hmm. It changes everything. And so right. that's really great to hear. Um, do you remember a specific financial event occurring during your childhood? For example, you know, mm. people have told me like, oh, you know, my dad almost lost the house because he didn't pay the credit cards. Or oh, wow. Like, for example, my father, unfortunately, and, you know, my parents, they went bankrupt when I was a kid. He owned a business and uh, uh, there was a market crash and long story. Oh, wow. but So, you know, I wasn't aware when that happened, but they told me about it. So it's kind of like it was almost like I was there. And of course, I was living the aftermath of it. But, Mm -hmm. you know, I never forgot that moment, even if it was them telling me that it happened. Did anything like that happen for you that you remember Uh, specifically, good or bad? You know, um, I'd say my parents were very private people. And they didn't really tell me about a whole lot of financial matters Mm -hmm. when I was younger or even later. Um, I'm just now getting them to open up about some of their retirement accounts with me to talk about their plans and Mm -hmm. re-strategizing. But they've been very uh, hesitant to disclose stuff like that with me. So I I can't really recall anything in particular that was really impressionable. uh, Even if it wasn't your parents, you know, maybe a neighbor Mm. or friend or their family or just anything, you know, that kind of stuck with you. Yeah, actually, um, I, you know this person, um, a friend of mine in college uh, got cancer. He was 21 years old. And I discussed a little bit with this, this person about their financial situation with you know, the, their medical scenario. And they had insurance, so it was definitely helpful. But they had a lot of extra medical bills that they needed to account for in addition to the loans that they already have out for their undergraduate education Mm -hmm. for music. Mm -hmm. Uh, So it kind of seemed that this person who's 21 years old is dealing with something horrific. Yeah. And their financial situation is like now foreseeably fucked for the next 10 or 20 years. And it kind of made a big impression on me that like, oh, this is, that things can sour quickly. Yeah. That one, all it takes is one odd thing to happen and then you can maybe spiral down into uh, a position of perpetual debt where you can't really get off of zero yeah yeah and so when you see stuff like that that's that definitely sticks with you um definitely so have you spoken or worked with a professional financial advisor uh actually no um i've talked to uh, people at institutions, but they weren't my technically my advisors. Mm-hmm. Like I haven't hired anyone like a CPA or mm-hmm. a CFP and, and gone over my personal finances. So my approach has kind of been, well, I don't know everything. So I'm going to learn as much as I can and read mm-hmm. and, you know, try to learn what those people, what resources they use. Yeah. Um, and so that's been helpful. Uh, I'm really a big fan of uh, Duke Kunkler's book. Uh, excuse me, Duke Kunkler. Always like mash that up. He he's got a great book called uh, Financial in, uh, Financial uh, Literacy, where oh yeah, you've got it on the shelf there. Yep. Nice. <laughs> awesome book. It's really condensed knowledge, and it kind of helped me get an idea of mm-hmm. where I am and what kind of things I should be doing even generically to plan for retirement and to little rules of thumb. Like one great one that I remember uh, that I really liked is about buying a car. So that you, know, you want to have five or 6% of your income every month put away for a new car fund. So you could pay for your car in cash instead of yeah. getting a car loan. So mm-hmm. it's one of the biggest uh, you know, detractors from your cash flow and from your uh, ability to achieve financial independence is just extra high interest loans. Yeah. Um, so I figure, okay, buy buy a car with cash, and then every two or three years, maybe you can sell it at just below the uh, the point at which the value curve drops off. Mm-hmm. So it still retains most of its value, and you can get a decent return 
and buy another car for much less money than if you had want, went and bought an entirely new car with cash. Right. So you can kind of do this iterative process every several years and uh, not have to really feel like you're spending a whole lot on cars. But yeah. it takes that first initial large purchase. Yeah. Just kind of thinking like that uh, opened up the door for, all right, well, why am I buying the cheapest, you know, crappiest item possible just to save like 50 cents? It's like, okay, maybe I should buy something higher quality so that I can enjoy it longer and it lasts longer and I have to pay less maintenance costs or replacement costs. Right. It's actually cheaper in the long run right. usually exactly. to do that. It's counterintuitive because you think, oh, it's cheaper now. But I think that seems to be one of the large uh, financial like informational nuggets is thinking about things over a long span of time. Mm-hmm. How do you propagate uh, use of an item over 20 years instead of over like next week. Right. And if you could think on larger time scales, that's going to help you plan for the future in a way that may seem counterintuitive at the present, but makes a lot of sense in five years or 10 years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, that book is amazing. I'll put it in the show notes. Um, so are you on the spectrum more of a saver or a spender? Mm, that's a good question because I feel like I oscillate. Um, there are periods where I feel like a saver and mm. I, I, I'm really obsessed about cooking at home and mm-hmm. not spending extra money. And I'd say I do that about 60% of the time. Mm-hmm. And then the other 40% of the time, it's like, I'm <laughs> shredding bills. Uh, <laughs> but it's on things that I think are valuable. Like yeah. I used to have a problem where, I would buy vinyl records like all the time. I became really obsessed with, uh, you know, I guess we would say like auto audio file equipment. Mm -hmm. So I, I have, we're um, in front of me right now is an amplifier that I bought this tube amp that has actual little vacuum tubes uh, that you plug in them. And I've got a deck and, $1,200 $1,200 turntable and all this like cool gear. And then I, I figured, well, I got all this gear. I need to buy all this vinyl and like appreciate it. And so <laughs> I think over a period of three or so years, I accumulated like 600 vinyl records Dang. and so much money, like stupid amount, like most of my extra cash was just going to stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so there are periods where I, you know, felt more hedonistic but then I kind of got hold of that as realizing it was like a, or in a compulsive spending habit. It's more like a, an addiction. And <laughs> I'd like to maybe explore this topic a little more if you, if you like about, yeah. you know, shopping as addiction. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I kind of felt when I recognized that pattern, it was like, okay, let's back up. We need to assess, you know, maybe let's not buy vinyl for a while. And then yeah. it was fine. I never really thought about it. Um, but now I'd say that most of my spending comes from books. Like I just was trying to read through a little bit of uh, Finnegan's Wake. I don't know if you know James Joyce. No. He's uh, kind of like, uh, how would I compare him? He would be like a considered equivalent of like he's a literary, literary genius on the par of like Mahler. So awesome. he's kind of like late romantic, postmodern, uh, has taken the much of what authors had done up to that point and aggregated a lot of different um, stylistic tendencies. And mm-hmm. it's kind of an amalgamation of several different languages. Um, and it, he self styled this book as a book for the night, that it's like uh, about the human unconscious and dreams and. So a lot of it doesn't make sense. It like starts in the middle of a sentence and you're like, okay, what's the context? (laughs) Uh, And it weaves together and loops and things are out of order. And so it's, it's really kind of like a fun mind puzzle. Uh, But so I I like buying stuff like that now. Mm -hmm. So I'll buy something I think is intellectually stimulating. Yeah. Maybe something for computer science that like I want to know or learn about Mm -hmm. Uh, things that I think will help me improve my skills. I think that's kind of the shift has been buying things in that category, like self-education more so than entertainment. That's interesting. So like you're still spending and, you know, you're being wiser about your spending, but you're also changing and 
the spending is more healthy. Yeah, it feels more like um, I'm, what's the word? My professor would always say like, your most valuable asset is your brain. Mm -hmm. It's like, don't worry about getting a specific skill. It's like, use your brain and you'll be fine. Yeah. And I think that's kind of true with buying stuff like educational material is that you're paying for delayed skill building. It's like, I'm going to have this skill in the future when I do read it, that's going to help me uh, in some way that I can't predict yet. Yeah. So it seems like more valuable than like, all right, I'm going to buy this video game and it's going to last me like 20 or 30 hours and then I'm going to like never play it again. And <laughs> there will be no value generated from this. Right. Um, but I still play video games. I don't want to confuse anyone and think that I don't do that. But <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. So why is financial literacy among musicians specifically important to you? Oh, man. Um, that's loaded a good question. question. Loaded. <laughs> <laughs> Nuclear bomb loaded. Um, man, I think that aside from it just being a personal issue, because I was a musician mm -hmm. and I still consider myself a musician, even totally. though I'm not you know, active. Um, I feel like there's just so much pain and suffering that's unnecessarily caused by lack of information, mm -hmm. lack of education mm -hmm. that I wouldn't put it on a conspiratorial level, but it is draconian how little financial education is taught in music schools. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's like one of the crux issues, single points of failure that they could bolster educational curriculum to assist people get off their feet or excuse me, get on their feet. Uh, mm -hmm. after getting out of school mm -hmm. and we took a course that was really helpful uh, called uh, music business entrepreneurship uh, taught by a great guy named Stockton Helbing mm -hmm. and uh, he's a local uh, musician and drummer uh, and educator in the DFW area mm -hmm. um, and he talked a lot about a lot of the issues we talk about you know etiquette for gigs negotiation tactics what's your worth uh, mm -hmm. determining business plans, all those great things. Yeah. Um, but that was virtually nowhere else in the entire uh, academic you know, experience that I had at UNT. Yeah. And it felt like there was something critically wrong about why this wasn't being discussed more. And I think the educational model benefits from people not really discussing it because they want more seats in the chair or more butts in the chairs. They want more tuition dollars and it's a business. I get it. But it seems that there's maybe like sins of omission mm. when you get to school and it's like, well, we're not really going to tell you about what it's really like until you're so far in that you like are kind of screwed and have to do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Cause imagine if you get everybody first year, freshman year in and have like a, a business entrepreneurship class about how you're going to survive as a freelance musician and what it's really like for normal musicians that aren't Chris Potter or Joshua Redman or, mm -hmm. you know, name your bread meltdown. Um, yeah. I think half of the people would just leave. And that seems to be the only logical reason why I can see why it's not being taught more because mm. it means a, a negative impact on their bottom line for tuition. Um, so it's really important to me because I've, I've seen so much tragedy from friends of ours, you know, people mm -hmm. that we're close to that are essentially continually in a position of, of financial insecurity because they can't really get above zero. And part of that is, I think, obviously everyone's responsible for themselves, but you know, with the deck stacked against you, it's harder to get to bootstrap yourself out of a bad situation. Mm -hmm. um, so I could think of a couple examples, but uh, there are, you know, for example, there's someone that I think we both know that uh, fantastic musician, wonderful guy, but cannot keep his finances straight because he's spending it on alcohol all the time. And it's like, I think that is its own, you know, conversation about addictions. But it seems to be that the music culture pushes people towards the like hang culture where you're out at night, late at bars networking quote unquote mm -hmm. uh, and the things that are you're told you're supposed to do feed directly into these behaviors that that mess up your stability in the future so for me i got into alcohol for a while and i mm. drank 
pretty heavily in my mid twenties at school and thought I was doing the right things. I'm hanging with the guys and girls who are playing and I'm getting to know everyone and I'm working on my networking skills. And to a certain degree, that's true. I think it's important to network. It's like meeting people and building relationships is crucial. Mm -hmm. Uh, But what's the context? The, The frame is like, we're at a bar, we're drinking, it's two in the morning. Now the next like 16 hours is shot for me. So I've got mm-hmm. to go recover and mm-hmm. maybe I'm not going to be as functional the next day. So I don't really like push my skill set boundaries forward mm-hmm. because you're constantly recovering from the night of <laughs> drinking before. Yeah. So I think that those kinds of habits that build up over time come directly from the mindsets that are, I would say, colloquially imposed on people. Mm-hmm. Like we've talked about this a lot where you know, you have the idea, these extreme ideas of either you're a starving artist or you're like Justin Bieber. And there's like no in between. Yeah. And I think it's totally uh, like a non sequitur because you're, people aren't accounting for the third option which, where the majority of the ground actually is in between those two extremes. Mm-hmm. So most people are actually doing okay. But in my mind, I would think, oh God, I'm not growing my network. I'm not getting those big break gigs. Like I'm going to be, you know, super poor and homeless and like become a schizophrenic homeless person in New York city. Like (laughs) (laughs) that doesn't necessarily mean that's what's going to happen. Yeah. Or that if I'm not as successful as Justin Bieber, I'm a failure either. Right. Um, So I think unnecessary mental and financial suffering is probably like the biggest reason for me why I think it's important to teach people and educate them who about, at least what the risks are, what your uh, options are, mm-hmm. and just getting more information so you can make better informed decisions. Yeah. Hit the nail on the head again right there. Do you want to talk a little bit more? You've been mentioning mindset, and we read uh, this amazing book. I think you recommended it to me. It's just called Mindset. But oh, yeah. do you want to talk a little bit about that? There's you know fixed versus growth. Sure. Um, Carol Dweck is the author. She's a professor at Stanford. Uh, Fascinating book where basically the distinction is that there are two main modes that people go into, a fixed mindset and a growth mindset, like you just said. And the fixed mindset is kind of characterized by a, and it comes from the name, a fixed set of assumptions that Mm -hmm. I'm X amount smart. Mm -hmm. And that you trying to improve yourself is futile because you know the outcome won't change. Right. And you making this assumption has a cascading effect of basically negative attitudes where if I'm trying to prove to other people how smart I am, that means I'm going to avoid conflict because it may expose areas of weakness that I can improve upon Mm -hmm. and that'll affect my character my perception of my character Mm -hmm. so that I'm identified with how quote unquote smart I am. Mm -hmm. And that kind of creates a spiral of negativity where you're going, well, I get a, I'll give you an example. You get a bad grade on an exam and you think, Oh God, this must mean uh, I'm not smart enough to do this. Mm -hmm. I'm going to fail out of this class. (laughs) Well, if I'm going to fail out of this class, then I'm going to not graduate from school and then I'm not going to get a job and then I'm going to like be homeless and, you know, it's like, oh, I should just kill myself. It's like, (laughs) wait, slow down. Slow down. (laughs) So I think these cascading effects uh, essentially propel you towards never growing, never Mm -hmm. actually allowing yourself the opportunity to be in a position of vulnerability that is the precondition for growth. Mm -hmm. So... uh, Contrarily, uh, growth mindset is more about keeping yourself in a position of vulnerability where you're saying, I don't know. I'm yeah. excited about being challenged mm-hmm. and excited about the prospect of sh- people showing me where my weaknesses are so I can improve upon them. And it's humbling because you yeah. realize I'm really fucking incompetent. <laughs> <laughs> and that's okay. Um, I really like how, uh, how she puts it. I, I'm going to paraphrase heavily, but basically, her line of thinking was something along uh, the argument of saying, don't worry about being the best you possibly can be right now. Make sure that you're doing gradual, continual improvement. Mm-hmm. Shoot for 51%, you mm-hmm. know, instead of 50, like trying to do 90% all at once. Just do 1% extra every day. Mm-hmm. 
and those will aggregate over a long period of time. And then soon you'll look back and go, oh, I've covered a lot of ground and it didn't feel like it. Yeah. And I think that's what, oh, sorry, go ahead. That's your story, right? That's my story, right? Yeah, definitely. Once we unlocked at least part of the growth mindset, here we sit now, not that long after, you know, it's amazing. Saying, wow, look, at this is crazy. How did this happen? Totally. And I think it happens by um, these slow building exponential gains. The, mm -hmm. It's exactly how compound interest works. It's the yeah. same phenomenon. And what makes me, you know, kind of smirk about this is the mathematics underlying mm -hmm. the natural flaw that we're talking about. It's because it's what the number E means, the, the mm -hmm. exponential number, mm -hmm. or Euler's number. And that number is, it's like 2.718 repeating some mm -hmm. random numbers. Um, they're not random, but lots of numbers. <laughs> um, and so this growth phenomenon, uh, you could model using this number, uh, an infinite number of like, for example, radioactive decay, it uses this principle. Uh, the amount of radioactive decay uh, is proportional to this number E. So when you do the compound interest calculation formula, uh, that is, directly related to the formula that we use to calculate radioactive decay. It's the same uh, underlying principle. Mm -hmm. So to me, that as a nerd, it's like, oh yeah, this is totally related. Like there's something about the way that reality operates that this number is encoded in it that gives rise to a lot of phenomena that we see. So mm -hmm. like compounded interest is a perfect example because you think, you know, I put a thousand dollars in a bank and I, put a hundred dollars in every month. And, you know, I think, well, you know, over 12 months, that's not really a lot of money. It's only, you know, 2,200 now total. Mm -hmm. And maybe I'm making 5% on it. And so I'm making like pennies, you know, you feel like, Oh God, this is going to take forever. Mm -hmm. Propagate that over 35 years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're making like 80, $120,000. I don't know exactly what the math is off the top of my head, but it's exponential. Yeah. Uh, after a certain point, you start to see those returns build on top of each other because mm -hmm. your gains are making gains on your gains. <laughs> gains on gains on <laughs> gains. <laughs> so it's uh, having that kind of perspective um, unlock the door a little bit with the growth mindset and saying like, okay, I don't need to be perfect. All I need to do is get a little bit better every day. And it, for me, it was like read it five pages. Yeah. Like start small. Simple. I don't have to read, you know, Finnegan's Wake in one sitting, which is like the, if you could read Finnegan's Wake, like this is the creme de la creme. If you could get through this, you're like, um, I don't know, Jesus Christ of the literary world or something. It's, <laughs> it's supposedly, I don't, I don't know what would the musical equivalent be like, you know, if you uh, could play all the Bach fugues from memory or something. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but um Due to your point about the growth mindset, I think uh, what was really key was getting these examples of CEOs and, and sports players. And uh, yeah, I think there was one about, uh, I believe, the CEO of Toyota. I cannot remember his name. But the example that she used was um, a kind of a before and after where there was a fixed mindset CEO who always was... Um, fearful of displacement. So he like shot down any new ideas because mm. he didn't want to be ups upstaged by people. Mm -hmm. And so his fixed mindset attitude basically tanked the company for a while. And then they replaced him with someone who was a growth mindset person and incorporated new ideas and was humble and was willing to work with people and have them show him where his weaknesses were so mm -hmm. they can all grow together. Immediate rebound within like two or three years. Yeah. It was like incredible turnaround with Toyota. Um, yeah. So when you talk about the compound interest, you know, it applies to the growth mindset. I think also for me, it I realized that it applies to the fixed mindset too, right? In reverse. Mm. Oh, yeah, exactly. And so this relates to The Slight Edge, which was one of the first books that really helped me work towards a better mindset. Um, Jeff Olson wrote that book and he talks about there's no straight line. So you're not, there, mm. you're never just, there's no neutral through, you know, movement through time. You're either, you know, imagine, you know, this, the compound interest um, exponential graph going up, right? 
and then mm-hmm. or going down and and those the distances between those two get further and further away from each other as yes. time goes on and you know you really have to choose um which where do you want to you want to go and so i apply this it's the growth mindset is going up fixed mindsets going down which one are we doing and on top of that what i really liked from the book was she talks about you know a lot of the fixed mindset comes from our upbringing and it's of no one's you know conscious fault but we're we're told no like mm-hmm. so much more than we're told yes when we're children mm-hmm. um you know don't go down those stairs you know you might fall or whatever you know just don't do that no you can't have this or whatever and um so inherently most of us maybe all of us have at least some s- amount of fixed mindset so when things happen we have we have this automatic trigger that goes off that is related to the fixed mindset so we have a fixed response to a lot of things maybe everything and (laughs) when you start learning about the growth mindset you don't evaporate and extinguish the fixed mindset what Mm -hmm. happens is you suppress um, the fixed mindset and put the growth mindset on top of it as soon as possible. So you're really yeah. just pushing the amount of time it takes for your mind to squash that fixed response and instead respond with the growth mindset. And exactly. um, so I think that's really important for people who want to start learning about this. And I also want to add that this is probably the most important factor regarding all of the things that, we're, we're, you know, we, we're talking about here. Um, but know that the fixed mindset will always be there, even if it's for a millisecond. And so I just, I want to reiterate that for those of you who start working on this, it does not go away, but you can, you can definitely suppress it, um, and truly benefit from definitely. the mindset. I mean, I even could, uh, give you an example from this past month. Uh, I'm just finished the, I'd say probably the toughest semester I've had in graduate school Mm because I was doing three tough courses. I was TAing uh, and I really um, didn't plan my time accordingly before. So I was some weeks I was working 80, 90 hours a week, you know, just if you counted all the time I was spending on work, uh, school related material. Mm -hmm. And by the end of it, when exams were hitting and all the projects were due at the same time, and I'm going for this interview in Boston around the same time, so I'm like trying to prepare for that simultaneously. Uh, it got to a point where like that fixed mindset just like was kicking into high gear. It was yeah. like a lot of these automatic reactions that we've built up over years from childhood mm-hmm. that they're still there and they're going to come out when you're more stressed. Yeah. When you have higher elevated levels of stress, they're going to try to impose themselves again. And that's something that I'm still struggle with trying to uh, appropriate say, okay, I know I'm stressed out. I know I want to do these bad things, whether if it's like order Chinese food or (laughs) not really go to the gym or, you know, do something that's like self carry for me, Mm -hmm. um, that I need to, uh, understand what is the appropriate action I should take and not just go to the default mode and do whatever feels right because Mm -hmm. those patterns can betray you even though you think you've gone beyond them. Right. Yeah. I have plenty of examples I could go into as well. Um, It doesn't go away. That's for sure. And I'm glad you brought that up about the stress because, you know, for, for the musicians listening, it can be a very high stress life, right? Yes. So it's really easy to to do to take those fixed actions. Um so to wrap up, can you give us if there's one piece of advice you could impart on our listeners, what would it be? There are a couple of things that I want to try to pack into a couple of sentences and Go for not it. be too Go as long as you need. about it. Okay. <laughs> so I would say, don't be afraid to be disagreeable. That's kind of the biggest thing that I've noticed about my life is that Mm -hmm. when I felt um, maybe too timid is the wrong word, but not confident enough to 
question conventional wisdom or what other people were telling me, then I was always just part of somebody else's agenda. Mm. And I think that's a big uh, break for me was that having the audacity to tell other people that they're wrong or that you're not going to, you know, acquiesce to their agenda or their Mm -hmm. decisions. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think like that fills in with what we've talked about with the musician's uh, mindset and thinking about being a starving artist versus a thriving musician. You know, if you're taught from a young age that musicians, though, they don't make a lot of money, you're not going to have a good, you know, career and you get those ideas printed into your head. Why? Mm-hmm. Who, who says that if I'm going to be a musician, I'm going to be unsuccessful and be poor and be living on the street. It's like, what, why do I just automatically believe that that's what's happened because 10 other people have told me that? No. Uh, same thing with, you know, changing it up. It's like, I think it's important that I made the decision even against my own logic where I was telling myself, I'm not good enough for this. Like I'm mm-hmm. not smart enough to move into a STEM field that's heavy um, in mathematics uh, and engineering. And it's not that bad. Like, I, I don't think that I'm such an intelligent person that I could just, you know, move into any domain and, and just pick it up. Like I've had to work really hard, but I think it's easier than people realize if you just kind of forego what other people say and only work with what's in front of you and really immerse yourself in whatever you're doing. Really go as deep as you possibly can and do deep work, which I think this is another reference for for your readers that you may have talked about already that uh, Cal Newport's a wonderful professor at uh, Georgetown University. And he um, wrote this book called Deep Work. And it talks a lot about the ability to focus for long periods of time in a really engaged way so that you maximize the amount of uh, efficacy that your studying or learning or productivity can have. Uh, So when I started thinking that way, I would sit down with a book for an hour and say, okay, I'm gonna learn something out of this. And I'm not gonna look at my phone. I'm not gonna have music on. I'm not gonna have any other distractions. And that, that kind of unlocked the door for me to go, I don't need to rely so heavily on what other people say because I've got information right here. I'm looking at it. I'm learning and I can base my decisions off of my understanding. And that's, I think, kind of a, what's the word? Almost like a metaphysical truth. It's like when you're doing that, I think the universe starts giving you things, uh, opening doors by saying, oh, you, you figured out some of the the operating principles uh-huh. of how things work yeah, and having that I think really is um, crucial to developing and paving your own path. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, so if our listeners wanted to contact you is what's the best way for them to learn more about you or just if they want to ask you some questions, where, sure. where, how can um, they find you? They can uh, shoot me an email. My, uh, my public email is my last name with my first three letters, uh, my first name at Gmail. It's St. George J-A-S. So it's S-T-G-E-O-R-G-E-J-A-S at gmail.com. So you're more than willing to, to talk to anybody if they want to shoot me an email. And I'd love to make connections with people. And if they have any questions, like if you have any musician friends who are you know talking about wanting to do something else and Mm -hmm. they can talk to me someone who's gone through the process and you know can hopefully give you some information about what it's like um i am working on getting a blog set up Uh, hopefully that will happen in the next month or so um but i will give you that information when it's up and running so you can link it if you want yeah Wonderful. So I'll put that in the show notes so that you guys can send Jason an email if you have any questions. And I'll put all those book references in the show notes. Um, Thank you so much for talking with me today, Jason. You're welcome. I hope all of you enjoyed this and I hope it was helpful. And I hope you all have a wonderful day. Keep thriving. 
want even more ideas, tools, and resources on how to break through to the next level of financial and creative freedom, check out the leading financial blog for musicians at spencerlist.com, where Spencer covers the latest trends and financial strategies. And by signing up for the Thriving Musician newsletter, you can earn exclusive member content and discounts. Get it all at www.spencerlist.com. If you would like to nominate a thriving musician for an interview on the podcast, request Spencer to speak at your school or event, or want to submit questions or comments, please send an email to spencer at spencerlist.com. And keep thriving. <laughs>